we are now back with the newest chapter of Dragon Ball Kakumi. In the last chapter, we follow Khalifla, Kale, and Kaba and their attempts to save Bulma. If you haven't seen it, I'm gonna leave a link to it in the description below and the top comment. Go ahead and check it out. We are now back with Vegeta against the venerable heir. The heir has stated that Vegeta has way too much power in the blue form than he should be currently allowed, meaning that Vegeta's blue form is now as strong as it's going to be, but has the potential to be stronger. But the air is literally digging into Vegeta's side by saying if this is incorrect, well, Bulma won't last till the end of the day because remember, he sent his minion after Bulma to really push Vegeta over the edge. Vegeta says, I won't pay any attention to your pitiful provocations, Moon Face. I know these young people inside and out, and I know they won't fail. However, you're a little too prone to opening your big mouth for our interim god of destruction. Let's let our fist finish the conversation, shall we? The air is ecstatic about this because remember, this stop on planet Sadala is literally just a pit stop. It's not even something that he really desired to stay there long term. But it's turning out to be a great blessing for him because now he's testing out his strength as a interim god of destruction or essentially like a god of destruction in training against a mere mortal. He now wishes that this fight could last forever. But before the fight gets started, Vegeta realizes a horrible truth. That is that Bulma's key is gone. And if you don't know what happened, I'm gonna leave a link to the video prior to this one. Go ahead and check it out. This is enough to push Vegeta into hyper-realistic, cel-shading, dark horse type of manga panel because this is gorgeous. Vegeta is thinking the worst at this point. He thinks that Bulma has finally met her mark because everybody else could not protect her. I mean, they are going against somebody that is around the same level as the gods. So yeah, it would have been far-fetched for them to be able to protect Bulma on their own without a few sacrifices along the way, which is what ended up happening. And the heir couldn't be happier because he's noticed the exact same thing. My Bulma is gone. Her key has completely disappeared. And Vegeta's not thinking that Bulma had some sneaky plan up her sleeve, no. Vegeta's thinking that this guy killed Bulma. One of his henchmen killed her on his behalf, so... Vegeta is about to get cracked here because even the venerable heir is ecstatic to see what's gonna happen next. Vegeta goes berserk in Super Saiyan Blue while transforming into something that we've never seen before. The venerable heir also explodes knowing that yeah, he can't just stay where he's at right now. He needs to take it up a notch as well because Vegeta's coming out for blood. He has bloodlust in his eyes. We are immediately interrupted with the fight against one of the venerable heir's other henchmen this guy is the trickster he's the one that made broly go berserk and attack the rest of the planet sadala soldiers and so this is something that the king cannot let stand he's feeling it he's feeling like a bunch of key just disappear all over the planet everybody he's known is getting murked and on top of that, he can also feel the key from Vegeta's wife completely gone. And the only thing that this guy's got to say to that is, then the cleaning is effective, which probably the worst thing to say. This is where the king of Planet Sadala really takes a turn here because he is literally just kind of blaming himself for all this, which he, he is a little bit to blame. He has spent so much of his life not wanting to to use the the super saiyan transformation not trying to use the abilities of the super saiyan and be extremely peaceful which as you guys can see with kaba it is effective in making everybody very lazy so even when vegeta's coming to train everybody he's been on the back burner and when his planet got invaded by these these gods he has really it took him a while to basically jump in. It really took until Broly was berserk for him to do anything or to confront anybody. And now he blames himself for the deaths of the children and the soldiers and the citizens of Planet Sadala. Badula is just so happy. He's having the time of his life. He thinks these are big words for somebody who hasn't even landed a finger on him. Remember, he's using this sort of teleportation magic to not only transport other beings and just their attacks, but also himself. So 
he is probably the biggest instigator in all of Kakumi history. Like, this guy is insufferable. I love him. But all that talking really bit him in the ass here. And, I mean, this is like some of the most gruesome, gruesome Kakumi images that I've seen in a very long time. Like, look at this. Look at the blood just shooting out of his mouth. The king has struck him, finally while he is so busy gloating about not being hit, which is probably the dumbest thing to, to gloat about because then you're gonna get hit. He doesn't even have time to curse him out completely because he gets hit yet again, and this time an uppercut in the stomach. This guy's not really physically strong. It's his magic that's strong, and so somebody like the king, it's a perfect type of fight for him because he is kind of rusty, hasn't fought for a long time, isn't anywhere near close to the level as Vegeta, but at the same time, he is the strongest Saiyan, at least he was the strongest Saiyan, for a very long time on the planet. And then he uses key manipulation, I love it. He makes himself a battle axe through his own key. This could be a heavy metal rock poster right here. I absolutely fucking love this. It just looks so raw on so many different levels. I can't even tell you how good this looks without going into an entire other video about it. Like. This, the artwork for Kakumi deserves a video of its own, honestly, but he looks fantastic and of course he's gonna do what he wants to do with that axe and that is cut my boy's arm off and then the king stops momentarily to ask him a question about the demons and if they love the darkness, why do they always come out and try to absorb light? Dula only has one answer to this, he says, it's because uh, we are born from chaos. It's just what we do. What? What? Okay, that is sick. It looks like that's his arm. The demon's arm going right through the king's stomach. Like, look at that. I'm gonna have to do a warning for this video. Like, look at the blood just shooting right out of his chest. This, this is insane. Like, the blood is splurting right out of his mouth. This is, this is a death shot. He created a portal in the nick of time using that arm that was just severed as a weapon against the king to basically go in for a killing shot. This guy is completely insane. Not only is he durable enough to take hits from a super sane king, but at the exact same time, he has the magic to be able to face off against somebody like Broly. But the king realizes there's only one more thing that he can do. And so he uses all the key in his body and focuses all into his fist. And with that, as you guys can see right here, it's embodiment all around his fist. It just looks so darn cool. He sears the wound closed. And you can even see sound effects here of it burning the skin. It's burning his skin. He doesn't, he feels the pain, but he's not reacting to it, which is something that the demon doesn't, doesn't realize what the hell's going on. I mean, look how beat up he is. Like he has been acting and reacting to this pain all day long, but the cane does not feel it. After searing it, and you can see here that it is coming out of his mouth, because this was literally his stomach. So him searing it and trying to close it up probably means he doesn't really have a stomach anymore, but I mean, the steam is coming out of his mouth, so there's probably still some, some fluidity in that. But it is time for the king to take this seriously because he did promise Vegeta that he would give it his all when he comes to fighting these monsters. With that, the king begins to harness energy and you can see right here how happy he is because he realizes that the only way to kill this creature is to sacrifice himself as well and to sacrifice every portion of key that he's got in his body. Sacrificing all his belief, sacrificing everything he stood for, sacrificing the one thing that he told himself he wouldn't be doing. He told Vegeta basically he wouldn't be doing up until this point and that is go into Super Saiyan, proper Super Saiyan, for the first time in I don't even know how long. He told it in his story at one point that he even tried to go into it. But yes, he finally goes into Super Saiyan. The beard with the hair, he just looks so freaking rad. Even got the little hair coming off here. Like, he looks like a Viking Super Saiyan. I, I think this is probably one of the coolest images in Kakume. We now cut back because remember, Kakume is taking a little hiatus till I think October or November. So we're getting through all these stories as fast as possible. But we cut back to the other venerable heirs demon, the assassin, who is now being used as a punching bag by a secret technique 
from the Tuffle Saiyan hybrid, the one that was attacking him in the last chapter. And he explains that he is neither Saiyan nor Tuffle. He is just a child of planet Sadala. So he is something in between. Remember, in planet Sadala's universe 6, he and the rest of the Tuffles live side by side with the Saiyans. And he is one of the very few hybrids that is able to use the Saiyan strength and abilities and uses the tuffle technology in mind but the demon's not hearing any of this and attacks him again right in the stomach i mean he must realize at this point this is not gonna do much because he just pops up right behind him and attacks him again with the exact same attack the one attack that is doing so much damage to him that he can't get past these holograms that the tuffle is using are just so detailed they have smell they give off heat they just seem like carbon copies of the original and the magician is trying to figure out how this works the tuffle finds this hilarious because it's like why as a magician are you trying to rationalize what's going on here and i think that the demon is starting to like pepino a little bit more he's starting to like him because he is just drastically as a mortal just trying his hardest to defeat this demon and he's doing a pretty bang up job here but i feel like there is going to be an ending here that is not going to be fair for Pepino. But before that, he gets hit again with this devastating attack, this time double by both the hologram and the original. And this attack is almost, I would say, like Rosengan kind of. It feels the way that it is. They had it at the very end of the last chapter where he had it, developed it and he showed it off. But now he's realizing that he can use it with other holograms as well so it's almost like this character has become naruto by using clones and using rasengan attacks and this is cool because the demon is trying to analyze like his attack and who he is and even though the attack is doing a lot of damage the abilities the strength the speed everything is just still the same and you can see right here like it almost looks like chakra points and it just seems very naruto-esque at least this battle reminds me of naruto or some of the fights in naruto and he even claims that the attack isn't even up to speed, like it's not 100%, it's very very small, it's not fully powered up yet. But the demon still has one more attack up his sleeve and attacks him with a devastating key surge and this one is enough to go right through his body and fully put him down on the ground. While the Tuffle's body restructures and repairs itself because that's just some of the technology that they have in place, yeah, this attack is called the anti-space punch, meaning that he can attack from wherever he's at and it will feel like he's right next to him attacking him. So these punches are as devastating, if not more, because of the fact that he can attack them wherever he is. He can be really far away and these punches will hit just like if he was right next to them. So this is a devastating magic trick and just the the uh, fighting between a magic user and a technology user is why this part of the chapter is so interesting and it looks like it's over for this guy he's still restructuring he's still healing but uh, the Neiman's punches are used in this anti-space um, trick I guess magic trick and he's hitting him almost like Luffy is with thousands of punches at the exact same time. So many that he's literally frying his body faster than his body can heal. Like this is just devastating to the poor guy and he tried his hardest here to really save some time, buy some time for Bulma and the rest of them. But uh, he's getting toasted up here. He's getting clapped up here. And all it takes is one last punch, one last good punch for him to be put down permanently. But that's when the demon gets hit in the side and thrown into the side of a rock bed. As the smoke begins to clear, he looks onward and he's like, you're back, you make my job so much easier. Meaning that now he doesn't have to track these guys down. He can destroy them and use the magic of interrogation to kind of try to figure out where the hell is Bulma because the Saiyans are finally back. We see Kaba and Khalifla both in Super Saiyan 2 not sure what they're gonna do against this guy like that, but maybe they have Super Saiyan 3 right up their sleeve. But we'll see when the next chapter comes out, what is gonna happen next. Let me know in the comments below what you guys thought of this. It's going to be Blackscape signing off. Take care, guys. Subscribe for more content.